Green building refers to both the structure and the application of processes that are environmentally responsible and resource efficient throughout a building's life cycle, from planning to design, construction, operation, maintenance, renovation, and demolition. Oh, that's a lot of responsibility. This is a quote from the US Environmental Protection Agency. Now, I'm not a climate change denier, but I also don't believe that the world is going to end in 12 years because of climate change. I'm trying to stay in a balanced middle ground. I absolutely believe that we need to take better care of this planet, but I think that the word green has been overused. Green technology, green solutions, building green, going green. Even if that word had any meaning initially, it's now lost, diluted and vague. We can't talk about green buildings without mentioning LEED or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's the most widely used green building rating system in the world. LEED is for all building types and building phases, including new construction, interior fit-outs, operations, maintenance and core and shell. Depending on the number of points earned, buildings can either be rated LEED Platinum, Gold, Silver or Certified. Some popular LEED buildings are the Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in Pittsburgh. One Bryant Park in New York City, Shanghai Tower in China, Manitoba Hydro Place in Winnipeg, Canada, Facebook Headquarters in Menlo Park, California, The Crystal in London, UK, and Taipei 101 in Taiwan. In this video, we're going to go over five expectations of green buildings and look at the problems with them. The first is that green buildings use renewable energy. At first glance, converting wind and solar energy into electricity seems so easy and clean, but when we dive into the nitty-gritty of their life cycles, we realize how unsustainable they are. For example, the demand for rare earth materials like neodymium and dysprosium has grown exponentially, in part because of their use in wind turbines. 95% of these minerals are mined in China. Large tracts of land are now filled with toxic waste in polluted air, water and soil. Also, wind turbines are built to withstand hurricane-force winds. The massive fiberglass blades can't be easily crushed up, recycled or repurposed. You need heavy-duty diamond wire saws to cut them down at the end of their lifespan. After that, they are dumped in landfills. It's ironic that we use an excessive amount of fossil fuels to extract mineral ores, to manufacture the wind turbines, to transport the huge blades to sites, and then to decommission them. How is this green? Another example is the disposal of solar panels. They are made of a toxic cocktail like gallium, arsenide, crystalline silicon, lead, cadmium, etc. They should not be disposed of in landfills because the modules can break down and leach these toxic chemicals into the soil. The EU has made great strides in recycling solar panels and extracting metals from them, but it's just not as cost competitive as building new ones. Despite this, there is a growing disturbing belief that every roof surface must be covered with solar panels to save this planet. The average lifespan of a solar panel is around 20 to 25 years, so waste from that first wave of solar panel installations in the early 2000s is about to hit us hard. Did you know that burning wood, biomass and mill waste is considered green energy? Burning wood is very cheap but very inefficient. In fact, a megawatt of electricity produced by burning wood actually releases more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than burning coal. East Springfield in Massachusetts is ranked the asthma capital of the country. Residents believe that a biomass and wood-burning green power plant is to blame. Now, there are efforts to push the recycling of wind turbines and solar panels too. There are even proposals to cut up these massive fiberglass blades into smaller chunks to give them new life as pellets or as boards. But that brings us to the next issue. Green buildings promote reuse and recycling. In an ideal world where money doesn't matter, recycling wouldn't be an issue. But that isn't reality. The cost of recycling exceeds the revenue generated in most cases. For example, taking apart a standard 60-cell silicon panel can get about $3 for the recovered aluminum, copper, and glass. But the cost of recycling that panel is between $12 to $25, much higher than compared to the cost of dumping it in a landfill, $1.
I'm not saying that all recycled materials are bad. The more waste we can keep out of our landfills, the better. But forcing architects and designers to spec products with a certain percentage of recycled content isn't a green solution. The metal scrap market is an excellent example. It is safe to assume that the supply of recycled metal is constant. If one manufacturer is forced to increase the recycled content in their product, another manufacturer has to turn to virgin metal instead to produce the same output. In this way, recycling can actually grow the market and increase mining rather than encourage people to look at better alternatives. Remember the three R's we were taught as kids? Reduce, reuse and recycle. Of the three, I think reduce is the most important but is unfortunately emphasized the least. Once we purchase an item, it has already entered the market and it's too late. Reusing and recycling seems to be superficial feel-good action steps. But we live in a consumer-driven economy and society, so reduction of consumption isn't pushed. Okay, now Chanel, you're in desperate need of Chanel. Next, green buildings efficiently use energy, water, and other resources. I absolutely agree with improving building practices so that they aren't energy guzzlers. It is important to improve insulation, reduce air leakage, design more efficient HVAC systems, water-efficient fixtures and appliances, reuse grey water for irrigation, capture rainwater, etc. But we cannot ignore building construction science. When we add on extra layers of insulation to a building and increase the thickness of panels, we are changing the dew point location in the walls and changing the perm ratings of the system, which can lead to condensation and reduced drying potential for water and vapor. I spoke about vapor in my last two videos. I'll link them up here. Additionally, let's look at some of these LEED certified green buildings. Notice a common trend? the excessive use of glass. The R value of glass cannot compete with the R value of a solid wall. If you want to reduce the energy consumption of a building, reduce the amount of glass used. This again comes down to money. Every cut that you make in a wall equals cash because of flashing and protection from water penetration. So it's cheaper for developers to choose an all glass building. Another expectation is that green buildings are literally green. A green roof is a layer of vegetation planted over a waterproofing system on your roof. It can help you earn lead credits and is usually a sign of a green building. These vegetative roofs are riskier than conventional roofs due to constantly wet conditions. They add significant load to your building, which equates to more material reinforcement. They must be carefully designed, constructed and monitored after construction. Planting fully grown trees in balconies is another ridiculous design decision that is considered to be green and a way to purify air. Lastly, green buildings use the latest eco-friendly technology. The LEED Green Building Credit System opened the floodgates to brand new technology and products that claim to be far superior and eco-friendly to traditional building materials. I am not opposed to innovation. We need to push ideas and find better ways to live. I don't think that stagnation is a good thing, not at a personal level and definitely not for an economy. But some of these new materials have not been field tested over a long period of time compared to other tried and true materials. I've worked at architecture and interior design firms across the states. There is a disturbing lack of understanding of building construction science by the designers specifying these products. We look at their appearance, lead credits, and take their spec sheets for granted. We don't realize that the products will not work as intended if they are not properly installed. Contractors and subcontractors on site have the difficult task of understanding these new materials, how they work, and how they must be installed. Blind acceptance of new products can be disastrous as we have learned from single-use plastic. In the 50s, 60s and 70s, there was a huge push in advertising for disposable plasticware that would change people's lives, reduce the cost of products and usher in the age of convenience. Fast forward 50 years and this reckless consumption of single-use, non-biodegradable plastic is choking the planet.
The LEED Green Building Rating System has come a long way and will only improve. I understand that we have to develop some way to rate a building and determine how green or eco-friendly it is. And a rating system seems to be the best way to standardize the process. But it can lead to some ridiculous design decisions. I lived in New York in 2013 for a couple of months and I visited the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, which is a LEED Silver Certified Building. It's an interesting, compelling design, but when you walk to the rear, you can find thousands of unused bike racks. Why? To gain LEED credits. How is that green or sustainable? This is the drawback of a rating system. Designers will find the cheapest and easiest way to earn credits. Another example is the Palazzo Hotel and Casino in Vegas. This 50-story complex managed to earn a LEED Silver certification too, which gave them a $27 million tax break over 10 years. In conclusion, making environmentally conscious decisions at both a personal and a professional level is vital, but we cannot do it blindly. Green building design should prioritize climate-specific and nation-specific standards. What works in one region will not work in another. We also need to educate architects and builders on construction science so we don't just pick up and slap on materials. We have to understand how they work. Finally, we have to constantly evolve. If a particular green building failed, we should accept it, learn from it, and then make the necessary changes. The rating system cannot remain stagnant. It's not the word green itself that's troubling. We can replace it with anything else like eco-friendly, clean, energy saving, environmentally safe, ecological, etc. It's the idea that if you tick certain boxes, you've done your part in saving the planet, when in fact, you might be doing more harm than good. Let me know what you think about green design in the comments below. I'll also provide a link to my Patreon page if you'd like to support me, I'd really appreciate it. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching. See ya.